Hello and welcome to the third and final workshop of the AWP Exchange, Detailed Design and Construction. Today, before we begin, we're going to just give you a little info about O3. And we are a modern web-based platform that leverages advanced work packaging and agile best practices to disrupt the status quo for companies in industrial construction who want to improve productivity, safety, quality, and predictability. So with that, let's uh, dive into a quick safety moment. So this one's on overloaded circuit protection. Um, this is something you may not think about too often, but there's a few things to know the signs and they can really help you prevent fire or blowing out your circuit at your home uh, or office. So some signs to keep aware of are flickering, blinking, and dimming lights, warm or discolored wall plates, uh, some crackling, sizzling, buzzing receptacles. Um, definitely don't want any noise coming out of your cords. Uh, a burning odor, a mild shock from appliances would probably be a pretty obvious one there. And then insufficient power when items are turned on. Um, and some ways to prevent it, you can plug appliances directly into an outlet you can always declutter. The image here on the left is a great example of what not to do. So you can unplug them when not using them. Uh, you always check your wires for damage and make sure you use dedicated circuits for large toasters, hair dryers, space heaters, et cetera. Um, and just a quick stat that nearly 50,000 home fires in the United States are caused by electrical malfunctions each year. So just some helpful things to keep in mind that can really prevent a, a disaster or a problem in your home. <clears throat> so now let's go over the agenda. Today, we're gonna talk about first, the background of AWP and what the AWP implement, implementation toolkit is. Um, and then we will go through the available material that we've already published. Um, and then the plan for the toolkit, part three. And then we'll follow up with an interactive session using Mural, um, and we will review the existing plan, brainstorm new ideas, and then we'll let you vote. So as a reminder, you received a Mural link yesterday in your email, so don't forget to click that to join that portion of the webinar. And then finally, we'll uh, give you a deliverable location. So <clears throat> we'll show you where you can find all of these published materials. Okay, so now let's introduce Andrew Foy, today's speaker. He has 16 years industrial construction experience, six years in AWP dedicated role, implementing AWP programs for several large clients. He's the co-chair of CII Performance and Benchmarking, Benchmarking Subcommittee on AWP, and he's a member of CII AWP CBA leadership team. So thanks again for joining us today, Andrew. Um, and with that, I'll let you take it over. Thank you very much, Tori. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third and last in our three-part series of workshops supporting the AWP Implementation Toolkit. So firstly, a little bit of background. Uh, CII made advanced work packaging a best practice in 2015. Since then, various subcommittees, including the one that Tori just mentioned that I'm working on, um, and working groups within CII are steadily developing more material to support AWP implementation and usage. But what we're seeing is a lack of a single complete walkthrough for how to do AWP on a project that's based, something that's based on an actual project, something that's based in reality rather than theory, and something that gives proper consideration to the technology that's involved in supporting AWP. So today we want to do a review of O3's plans for what we're referring to as an AWP implementation toolkit. So for those of you who joined us in the previous workshops, this is going to act as a brief reminder. And for those of you who weren't able to attend our previous sessions, this is going to give you an outline of our plans for the toolkit and how it's going to work. So what we're looking to do here is we want to help companies that are starting on their AWP journey to understand a systematic step-by-step -step approach for implementing AWP. And we want to do that using a sample project. We want to step away from the abstract. We want to stay away from the theory. We want to make this real using actual models, real world examples, project specific content. We want to make the deliverables 
relatable and easy to understand for project professionals. Have it something that when a project professional is looking at the information, they recognize what it is and it relates to the kind of work that they're doing. So why would you listen to us? Firstly, I'm not going to tell you we have all the answers. Nobody does. That's part of the reason we're meeting today. But O3 is the first and only software solution dedicated to supporting AWP across all project phases. We as a company know what is needed to make AWP work. And personally, I have years of real world experience creating and rolling out AWP programs, oftentimes from scratch, for various organizations throughout North America. So if you're responsible for making AWP work in your organization, I've been in your shoes, I've sat in your chair. What we're gonna do is share this experience and combine that with the most advanced AWP software on the market. So another question, why are we giving this away for free? Yes, we could be charging for this, but in reality, we want the AWP community to grow. We want to help move the industry forward. And the best way to do that is to spread the message to as wide an audience as possible. We're already starting to see from some of the communities of practice that are popping up all over the world. AWP is gaining a lot of momentum in a lot of different parts of the world, not just focused anymore on North America. But what we are seeing is there's still a lot of people who are new to it, who don't know the mechanics of it and are still trying to learn their way through it. So the intent here is to provide some of that detail. So one of the things we want to tackle is simplification. There's a lot of information about AWP, some of which we'll go through today, some of the available material just on the market in general. It's easy to get flooded with detail. You can literally sit with a stack of hundreds of pages and spend days and days reading through, and it tends to be a little bit dry because again, it's theory. It's not talking to you at a project level. So for all of that detail, for all of those hundreds and hundreds of pages of information, the message sometimes lacks what I refer to as a headline, um, the simple message, you know, build work packages. Some tools like the AWP Primer that CII has put together try to distill AWP down into its basic components, which is a great start. If you want a 101 version or the sort of first page version of what AWP is, it's a great place to start. But what we want to provide with this toolkit is a way to understand AWP that doesn't scare people off doesn't make people think you need a PhD in astrophysics to understand it. We want to make the project situations relatable and the detail appropriate for the audience. So what are we gonna do with this toolkit? What it's gonna be is a series of deliverables that are gonna be released periodically over the next year. This is not a short or simple exercise for us. We are literally going to create a project, run the whole project through the AWP process and pass those deliverables out as we go. The first batch of deliverables associated with what we're calling learning about AWP are already available on our website. And for those of you who sat in, that's the stuff we covered in the first of these workshops. The second batch relating to AWP procedure and workflows have now been uploaded as well. And those are gonna be available with the link that we'll share at the end of this session. So the first set is talking about how to get started but critically, the second set and a massive important part for anybody getting started, we've literally created an AWP procedure and we're giving it to you in Microsoft Word so you can go away and use it. So if you're starting your journey and if you're not sure how to start with AWP, you can spend months or in some cases years developing and polishing a procedure. Uh, before you get started with AWP. What we're trying to do now is simplify things and accelerate your AWP implementation. So to do that, we've created a procedure for you. That being said, it's, you know, you'll have to change the logo to your company's logo. You might have to tweak some of the language to match your company's internal processes. But what we're trying to give you with all of these things is a starting point. And we wanna give them to you in native format so you can use them, you can modify them, and you can just take whatever information you feel is gonna be of use from. So let's have a look at the planned content of the AWP implementation toolkit. So what I'm gonna run through is, here's what we plan to give you. Here's the things that we plan to include in this toolkit. And the reason for the mural session that's gonna come in the second half of the meeting today 
is we want to understand from you, okay, this is what we think we're going to give you. What else do you need? What else do you want? What else is going to be important for you to understand? What else can we help you with? So the planned content, like I said, for the learn section, which is the very first one, is just, first of all, understanding what AWP is, how it can help your organization calculating the value of AWP, making a business case for its use. How do you sell AWP within your organization? So if you are the nominated AWP champion for your company, you've been tasked with figuring out what AWP is, whether it makes sense for your company. Oftentimes that involves somebody who doesn't understand AWP saying to you, figure this out. And oftentimes that involves you sitting down with that blank piece of paper saying, where do I even start? So this is the where do I start section. In this section, we're gonna cover how to learn about AWP and wade through the mountains of information to really get a grasp on what AWP is at a practical level. We're gonna look at how to calculate return on investment by assessing the costs and benefits of AWP to make sure it's gonna bring value. And on a side note, AWP isn't all about money. It will bring benefits on safety, quality, schedule, predictability, a range of areas. But until the world changes, the first thing most companies want to know is how much is it going to cost me and how much am I going to save? So we always have to make sure that we start there because unfortunately, unless it's going to be a financial benefit to your company, most companies don't want to do it. So then once we've done that, a return on investment calculation, once we've seen that AWP is going to save us money, then we're going to look at building that business case for implementing AWP. Is it just a question of knocking on your boss's door and saying, hey, we want to do AWP? What do you need to do to get that level of management buy-in? So those are the first three deliverables that have been released on the website. Then once you've sold it to your management team, we're going to look at how to select a pilot project for implementation. Does it matter? which project you choose. And by the way, obviously the answer is yes, it does matter. Um, so the understanding of that one is gonna give you some, we can't tell you your project, which one exactly to pick by name, obviously, but we can give you some guidelines to say when you're picking a pilot project, here's the things to look for. So that's that selection criteria, how to pick a pilot project. So then we get into the plan section and we're getting into some of those practicalities of early implementation steps. So that procedure that I was talking about, we've created a procedure and the associated workflows for you to use, if you wish, as your AWP manual. So it's intended to be a step-by-step, paint-by-numbers guide for implementation. We wanna get rid of the idea that AWP is this giant, complicated beast that's somehow gonna mess with everything you do in your whole organization. We want to show that it can be a very simple, systematic approach and what we've done is we've broken it broken it down into the project phases so you read from page one and you basically follow along the procedure as you go through the phases of a project here's the things you need to do during fel2 or select if that's what you call it here's the things you need to do during fel3 or feed or define depending on your terminology here's the things you need to do during detail design it literally walks you through step by step and again it will not be the final deliverable for your company but it's a starting point, something that will give you a start and then you can go away, figure out what works for you and have a basis to start adapting that procedure to make something that's gonna be unique and workable for your company. And then what we want to get into is the big question of what to consider when looking at AWP technology. So the old wisdom had it that you need to spend a long time getting your AWP process nailed down before you even think of technology. But the O3 platform has been purpose built to support AWP from start to finish. And the best practices, all of that CII information, that's been consumed and literally baked into the product. So instead of having to spend a whole massive amount of time figuring out what you need to do with your process and then trying to layer pro, uh, technology in on top of it and having effectively two large change management situations, you can combine all that together. And the technology, will give you a solid foundation for your AWP implementation. Okay, so now, next set of deliverables, the next phase of the project. We're into FEL2 or select. 
And again, these are the deliverables going to be associated with that phase. This is where the rubber meets the road. You're in a project and you're actually implementing AWP. So first up during FEL2, what we're going to look at showing you is how to create construction work areas, how to mark up the plot plan, how to decide how big the boxes should be. The most critical one on any project to do with AWP is how to do a path of construction. What does a path of construction look like? And again, what we're trying to talk about here is, is not the theory of here's a template, figure it out for yourself. Here's an actual copy. Um, we'll look at a work breakdown structure and we'll look at what an AWP plan looks like. So these are the building blocks for AWP. These are the things that if you have the opportunity to start early in the project, just after concept select and get into it during FEL2, these are the things that will help you get set on the right path. So that path of construction is the single most important thing you're going to do for AWP on the project. You need to give it the attention it deserves. So with all of these things, we're not just going to tell you how we did it. We will have a document with each one of these deliverables that says what we did and how we did it. So you understand it's not just here's the solution. But we will also provide you a functioning copy of what a real one looks like and a template for your use. So you can then take that away, modify the template, put your own logos in it and start using it yourselves. So I realized that doing anything during FEL2 can seem a little daunting. Um, you're typically at a point where project information is very minimal. The design progression has hardly really started, but this is exactly the reason why now is the time to do it. For any of you who've seen, there's a very simple graph that they use for constructability and, the, and the, the sort of implication of the timing of constructability input. And the earlier you do it, it has much more profound impact and it drops off precipitously as you get through the engineering phases. AWP is exactly the same. Your construction decisions will have the greatest chance of meaningful impact on the project if you do them early. Those design optimizations are easier to incorporate when they don't risk extensive rework. So getting started during that FEL2 time, basically as soon as you've chosen your, your solution, once you've taken those four or five options that you identified during FEL1 and boiled them down to one solution, that's the best place to start doing your, your AWP, marking up your plot plan, figuring out your path of construction. Though it needs to be said, make sure you have construction input to concept select so that the people who are going to have to build it have a say over which solution you're going to implement. And that, again, is one of those things that sometimes gets lost. All of this being an important facet of getting construction in the room early, making sure that you have that construction input. So then the second part of this, what we're calling here part B, as you get to the end of FEL2, you're going to go through a stage gate. Again, most companies will use a stage gate process. So we're going to be looking at creating the master work package index. So we're starting to lay out what our EWPs and CWPs are going to look like. We're not building EWPs and CWPs, but we're saying, here's how they're gonna be set up, here's how they're gonna be numbered, etc. We're gonna look at an AWP compliance schedule, which is, we're not trying to teach people how to use Primavera. What we're talking about is what do you need to do to make sure that your schedule supports the AWP process? So again, this is not going to be a, a lesson on scheduling. It's going to be a review of how AWP impacts the way that you already do your schedule. Um, the last thing we're going to look at is a project estimate. So like I say, for things like the schedule and the estimate, we're not going to create a user manual for your estimating software. We're not going to give you an estimating procedure. Most of your companies will already have that. We're just going to look at the ways that AWP creates impacts to how you do the schedule and estimate. Very simple things like the way it's broken down and aligned. You need that early alignment between the deliverables, especially to make sure that you get in lockstep between the work packaging and project controls. So it's things like get your name and convention sorted out. Make sure that everyone on the team knows the priorities in the sequence. And if you can do that during those early FEL phases, you're well on your way. Okay, so now we're moving on to FEL3. So in FEL3 or feed, we're gonna refine the path of construction with the additional information. AWP during this stage 
is going to mirror the overall stage goals. FEL3 is all about optimization. So the path of construction from FEL2 was not perfect. You didn't know everything, but it gave you a starting point. Much in the same way as you'll take your estimate from the end of FEL2 and your schedule, and you'll refine them. You'll make them more detailed. You'll have additional information. So what you're looking to do during this stage in the early part of FEL3 and for the path of construction right the way through FEL3, you're going to challenge your assumptions. You're going to make sure that every stakeholder has a voice and you're going to finalize your plan by the end of the stage so that the engineers can meet your expectations during detailed design. And this is one thing that I always have to bang the drum about because people think the path of construction is this living document and you can keep tweaking it to make it better. Tweak it through FEL2 and FEL3. At the end of FEL3, lock it down. And everything after that should be considered as critical as a change management process for in order to justify modifying the path of construction. You wouldn't add a new piece of equipment during detail design. You shouldn't be adding that even much during FEL3. It's just a question of optimization and locking in that path of construction so that the engineers can actually live up to what you're asking for. So we're going to look at updating the master index and considering what the data requirements are for the three-dimensional model. The model is going to be an invaluable tool for AWP and particularly for workface planning, but a bad model with limited or incorrect data can cause a huge amount of additional churn and rework downstream. Getting it right from the beginning relies on making sure that the engineering contractor knows the expectations and can meet them. So, and we'll, again, we can provide you with data requirements for what's needed to support a model during FEL3 so that you're not letting the engineers run off, do what they think is right, and then come back partway through detail design and say, oh, sorry, this doesn't work for us. Here's what we actually need. Tell them from the beginning, limit the rework. Then for the end of phase deliverables, we're going to look at updating the estimate and updating the schedule down to the CWP level of detail, what I always consider a level three for the schedule, where every single EWP, PWP, and CWP is called out and named in the schedule so we can follow how exactly that goes from engineering to procurement to construction, and we can see when we can actually start these things. We're also going to explore the topic of including AWP in contract language. I've seen dozens of different approaches to this, and unfortunately, no two of them are the same. So what we're going to look at here is we're going to share our thoughts on the best practice approach, both in terms of content and timing. So those things, the learn, the plan, the FEL2, the FEL3, those are the things that we've locked in from our previous two workshops. Those are the things that those of you who attended workshops one and two, we had mural sessions for, and we were able to discuss, here's what we're going to provide, and we took some public feedback on what else we need to include. So for today, now we're getting into detailed design and construction. So for detailed design, and these are the things that we're going to now have the mural session on. So what I'm proposing to give as part of this AWP handbook for detailed design is the following list, the KPIs, EWPs, CWPs, and constraint management. So in this phase, your plans have been made. You've done the early planning. Priorities have been set. All the project stakeholders know what the installation sequence is. Your schedule is going to keep it running like clockwork. So now, during detailed design, AWP focus switches to monitoring engineering progress, which, frankly, historically, has not always been easy. So we're going to look at things like key performance indicators for engineering. How do you keep a close eye on the deliverables? We're going to review what an EWP, an engineering work package, should be what it should contain, and frankly, equally importantly, what it shouldn't contain. We're going to look at what makes a good construction work package, and also what the difference is between the engineering work package and the construction work package. And then we're going to create the constraints we need to fully understand what has to be completed before an EWP or a CWP can be released. And again, this is not just going to be theory. We're actually going to give you an EWP or a CWP. It will be dummy data with dummy drawings for a dummy project, but rather than just saying here's a template with a bunch of headers, you can see the kind of information and the level of information 
that we recommend be put in there. And that's what we're hoping is going to be the added value of having this implementation toolkit is having a real world example to follow. So this is your last chance to get things right before the work transitions to the field. Any issues or problems that you have are going to cost far more to solve when they're discovered by an installation crew. So people will often worry about spending the money during the engineering phases. But the problem is fixing things upstream in engineering, whilst it can feel like a chore, is far, far more cost effective than having a crew of 10 people standing around at a job site waiting for an RFI response to give them permission to cut a spool because that spool is clashing with a steel beam. So that it's a false economy that we do historically on projects where we push the issues downhill. We, anytime any of you have ever seen the expression contracted to verify on a drawing, it just makes my skin crawl oftentimes. All we're doing is pushing the issue downhill and pushing it onto the people who are going to be actually trying to install it in the field. We need to make sure we're answering as many of the questions and giving it as good a detailed plan as we can during that detailed design. So if there's other things that you want to see for what other information do we want to include during detailed design, start thinking of those and we can put those into the mural session once we hop over to that part of the presentation. So then the second half of what we wanted to review today is construction. So we're going to look at breaking this down into three phases. What needs to be done before mobilization? What's going to be part of the work packaging effort? And then the progressing and closeout of the work packages. So what we're going to look to discuss here is things like the contractor's work phase planning plan. And that's not the same as you having a procedure for AWP. The contractor needs to tell you, depending on if you are the contractor or if you're the EPC or the owner, the contractor needs to come back and say, here's how we are going to execute work phase planning on this project. We're going to look at KPIs, key performance indicators for work phase planning, and how dashboards can be used to visually manage your work packaging efforts. Then we're going to cover the key topics of graphical and non-graphical work packaging for making IWPs. So for those of you not familiar with the phraseology, graphical means we're going to take that 3D model that we were talking about and we're going to use it as what we refer to as a virtual construction model. And we're literally going to be able to pull in information directly from that 3D model. I can click on three or four spools and drag them into an IWP. And that's my IWP. So that's what graphical work packing is. It doesn't rely on me flicking through mounds and mounds of paper. Non-graphical work packaging is a similar process, except instead of using the model itself, you're going to use lists, for example. So if you've got a cable schedule, you've got a list of all the cables. You can click on those cables that have embedded information in them about the size, the length, etc. And you can drag those into a work package. They're not modeled, they're not physical elements within the virtual construction model, but they're lists that you can pull information and use as the basis for non-graphical work packaging. Then we're going to get into constraint management. So constraint management is just making sure that we have identified everything that could stop us from executing the IWP seamlessly. So that's going to be the simple stuff. Do we have the drawings? Do we have the materials? And it's not going to be a simple checkbox exercise. Constraint management needs to be rigorously managed so that you know for sure. It's not just, oh, well, I think you know, Dave said, yeah, we've probably got what we need. Have you laid hands on the material? Have you checked that you've got access to the work front location? Have you got a plan for how you're going to get your scaffolding there? And do you have the equipment in place? Do you have the people with the necessary tools and training to do this? Rigorous constraint management is what is going to save you from having a whole lot of people standing around on that job site waiting for something. So then the last part we're going to look at, okay, now we're in the stage where our work packaging system is rocking and rolling. We're, we're in, we're building packages, we're executing the work. So we're going to look at progress and reporting. We're going to look at how do we show where we're at? How do we define how much progress we've made, how can we provide realistic and accurate data for how much earned hours we've gained on the project this week, where we should have been, where we actually are, and what's holding us up. And we're also going to include things like status visualization, which is a colorized version of the model to show that. 
we'll look at test work packages, which are different than the installation work packages. So the test work package is going to look at things like grouping components into, for example, a hydro test, so that you can test the system before you start looking to hand it over. Then we get into system turnover. So system turnover is to construction as engineering is on the front end. Engineering will design by system, construction will build by area, and then you have to turn over by system again, typically. So you've got two very major transitions throughout this process. So in the same way that we need to make sure that engineering is sequenced to support construction, we also need to make sure that construction is sequenced to support system turnover, especially where you've got intermediate handover dates and particular turnover system priorities. Then in a reflection of real life, we're gonna close out with lessons learned and continuous improvement. So that's the plan, that's the content. Every one of those line items that you see is gonna be a deliverable, which we're gonna publish on our website over the next year and say, here's what we did. And it'll be in the guise of an actual project. So today's workshop, we're gonna be focusing on managing AWP during detailed design and construction. So let's see what a couple of these things are gonna look like. Uh, so that essentially, this is going to be a preview of some of the kind of information we're going to share. In this case, we're going to look at engineering work packages and construction KPIs, key performance indicators. So firstly, let's take a look at the final engineering deliverable in the AWP process, which is an engineering work package and what should go in it. So what is an EWP? It's something that's produced by the engineering team that's a data deliverable that contains all of the discipline specific engineering documentation for a geographically designed scope of work. So to say that in another way, all of the piping in area four, all of the structural steel in area seven, that's the level of breakdown that you're going to have for an EWP. And you might get even more defined than that. You may split up your engineering work packages by different contractors, by uh, which work is going to be done as part of a turnaround or a shutdown, if that's going to be needing to be separated out. Essentially, the engineering work packages need to be the technical deliverables for the scope buckets, for want of a better term, that are going to be provided to the contractors. So those EWPs will have an explicit relationship with construction work packages. And typically, we start from the theory that they're one-to-one, -one, and you manage that as on an exception basis. So an engineering work package will then become a construction work package. So the engineering work package is the technical part. It's gonna contain scope of work, what the terminal points are, where it starts and stops, what all the materials are. You're gonna get a material takeoff that comes with each engineering work package, what equipment is included. And by that, we mean the equipment as in the pumps and motors, we don't mean the construction equipment, that's gonna be part of the CWP. Uh, what are the pre-existing conditions? What defined what we need to include in the EWP? Technical specifications, uh, specs is gonna be an important part of it. Vendor data, because a lot of these packages, especially once you get into things like equipment packages, you're gonna get a lot of information from vendors. You need to make sure that all that information that's relevant to the execution of the work is included. 3D model shots, because quite honestly, people love that graphical element. People love to be able to see it. It's a lot easier to understand the scope of work when, as you can see from the little diagram on the left-hand side, you can get a simple snapshot of what it looks like. Uh, specs and standards, reference lists, and which CWP this is going to relate to. So this is what we want the engineering work package to tell us. So the EWP is gonna include the drawings, the procurement deliverables, the specs, the vendor data, and it's typically defined, as I said, by discipline and area. You can get more granular depending on the nature and complexity of the project. So what to consider and what to avoid in your EWP? Firstly, and this is hopefully a fairly simple fundamental one, it's a single discipline in a single construction work area. You need to make sure it's aligned to your project work breakdown structure. If project controls is calling that area four, make sure you're calling it area four as well. If project controls has a discipline code for pipe that's 22, use the numbering system, create that alignment. 
Look at it from the perspective of how you're going to award the work. Look at it from the perspective of the contractor. You need to make sure that the EWPs are granular enough that you never, ever split them in two. You don't want to tear them in, in two and hand it to more than one contractor. All you're going to do that way is make it very, very difficult to understand the scope split, where the work is for contractor A, contractor B. You'll end up with finger pointing, no, he's meant to do that, no, they're meant to do that, et cetera, et cetera. So make your EWPs granular enough that you know that a single EWP is going to be handed to a contractor. A single contractor may get multiple packages, EWPs, CWPs, as, as they'll be by the time the contractor gets them. But you never ever, it's, you can do a many to one, so many packages to one contractor, but you never want to have one package that's divided up between multiple contractors. Contract language, personal pet peeve of mine, don't include terms and conditions in the EWP. This isn't a legal document. There's a whole section of the contract that's enough that you can include terms and conditions. There's no place for them here. Don't include them here. Uh, a good suggestion for things like um, site-wide scope and standard documents. So if you've got, for example, earthworks, you don't design earthworks by construction work area. You're going to get an earthworks package for the whole site because you know we need to figure out how we're going to have the, the rain runoff and where things are going to go. So that's all going to be released at the same time. So that can be released as a common work area. That way you're not trying to tell the contractor they've got to dig a ditch here in this construction work area and then in a separate package, dig the rest of the ditch in another construction work area. Use that as a common work area. Vendor information. Include all the relevant vendor information and specifically you're going to be looking at things that the field contractor needs to know, like what work isn't being done by the vendor, what's coming ship loose. What do I still need to finish off in the field? Make sure that's specified. Make sure that information is carried over. Make sure the vendor tells you. Don't just assume. Get that information from the vendor to say, what's going to be left by the time it gets to the field? Are you going to ship me two big crates with the word miscellaneous on it um, or you know, parts? What's left to do and what am I going to receive? Am I going to receive one big piece of equipment or is it going to be several crates of additional stuff that we need to install on the field? Describe the work to be done, but don't tell the contractor how to do it. You need to try and be careful in these things to try to avoid specifying. If you start specifying, you are, and this is where bullet two gets to, you're providing, a, essentially you're providing instructions to the contractor. If they're performing work on a lump sum basis, it's up to them to decide how to execute that work. The more of these instructions and more of the sort of how is going to impact their ability to manage the work and execute the work the way they see fit. For construction work areas, don't cross a construction work area boundary, but the things that do make rules. So for example, we already talked about that common work area for the early civil work, for example, but for things like cables, you're going to get some large home run cables that cross construction work areas. You're not going to split one cable across three or four different construction work areas. In that case, for example, what I typically do with that is define it as belonging to the end where it's going to have the, the device end, essentially, rather than having all of your cables coming out of your PDC belonging to the area where your PDC is, which is going to massively skew your quantity basis, have them belonging to the end where they're going to need to be pulled to because that's also going to tell you when they're going to be ready to be received. So you need to know they're coming from the PDC, what's the termination point out in the field. Specifications. Don't include specification language. Again, another pet peeve of mine, but if you've given me a specification as part of the contract, you don't need to take chunks of that and put it in the scope of work document in the EWP. I already know. It's in the specification. I've got to read the specification. That's my job as the construction contractor. So you don't need to flesh out this EWP and make it, you know, doesn't need to be the greatest works of Shakespeare. It doesn't need to be 500 pages long just for the sake of putting additional information into it. And lastly, 
tell us clearly what is not included. Tell us what's being done by others. Make sure that that scope is well known. Make sure to tell me your work finishes at this point. And by the way, somebody else is doing the NDE, for example, where, where the scope starts and stops. So that's some of the elements of uh, engineering work packages. Next up, we're going to talk about construction key performance indicators. So what should you be monitoring during construction to make sure that your work packaging effort is on track? First up, backlog. Amount of constraint-free work in hand to support the field personnel. We need to know how much work we've got in hand so that we can have the right amount of manpower planned for the work that we're going to execute. So this is usually represented as the number of days that we have available. You can represent it as the number of hours you have. And then if you know your head count, you can break it down to number of days. So if you've got, for example, two days of backlog for the people on the site, what that means is in two days time, they're gonna run out of work. That's a problem. If you've got 200 days of available constraint-free work, which by the way, is a joke, you won't. But if the number is too high, it means, you've got a lot of work in front of you and you probably don't have enough people on site to do it. So that IWP backlog, especially expressed as days, gives you a very good indication. Typically we try and target in the order of 30 days. So we've got enough work to keep our current crew busy for 30 days. Then when you go to have a chat, when the owner and the contractor are talking about, I need to bring out more millwrights, I need to bring out more welders, you've got a data backup for that conversation. It's not just an opinion. Average hours per IWP, how long, uh, sorry, how large are your IWPs? So there is a standard for those of you who've read the sort of CII best practices, they talk about 500 to 1000 hours. What I will say is that's a good standard and that should be your target on average. You will get IWPs that are going to be bigger. You will get IWPs that are going to be smaller. You will get some that are a couple of hundred hours. You don't want to force all of your IWPs exactly into that bracket. For example, if you're building an IWP, you might have one really, really large cable pool where it's like 1,200 hours for a single massive cable. You're not going to split that up. Um, and you might have one where there's only a small amount of scope that's pertinent for that time period, and it's 300 hours. But consider that 500 to 1,000 as a good mid-range and just verify where you're going to be. What the key thing you're looking for here is if you've got a contractor and every single work package that they're producing is 3000 hours, they're not following the best practice, they're not taking it seriously. They're just checking the box. So you wanna keep your average in that sort of 500 to 1000 range and manage by exception. Time in the field. So with a tool like O3, what we do is track the status of the packages. So we can say, you know, it's been initialized, it's in development, it's ready for review, it's been approved, it's been issued, it's in progress and it's complete. So what we're talking about here is the in progress part. That's the time it's in the foreman's hands. So typically you wanna be building, building your work packages for between five and 10 working days, a working shift, whether it's your shift is a week or you know, up in Canada, for example, they do a lot of 10 and four shifts. So you want to be building a package for that shift for that time period. If you're building them for five to 10 days and you're consistently seeing that they are in progress for 20 days or 30 days, you know you've got a problem. You know the package is sitting out there for too long. And typically what that means is they're getting done 80 or 90% and they're not getting finished and a four person is then working on another package and they're not finishing off that last 10% of the previous one. So you want to make sure that that in progress time period matches what the expectation is for how long they're going to be in the field. And you can break that down. You can separate that out by disciplines. You can see which disciplines are having trouble. You can even take it down right to the foreman or the planner level. It might be that one of your planners isn't doing a good enough job of constraint management and they're having packages that sit too long in the field. IWP readiness, constraint free. So this is sort of the other the flip side of the backlog conversation so what you're looking at is the average amount of time each package is ready to go 
so constraint free and approved and available before it's issued for execution. If you are hand to mouth, if you are creating your IWPs and issuing them and approving them 24 hours before you're going and building them, that's something you want to know. That's not a good way of running it. Equally, you don't want to be building them a year ahead and having them sit on a shelf somewhere for a year. That's no value added to that. So you're trying to target a good sort of range of packages that are on average, we'll say sort of 21 to 30 days on average ahead and ready so that they can be put on the three week look ahead, for example, constraint free and ready to go three weeks before they're going to be executed. Bear in mind with that, by the way, the constraint free part is a little bit of a strange conversation because you can rarely satisfy all of the constraints. So that's why we break it down into what we call soft constraints and hard constraints. So the hard constraints are things like, do we have the drawings? Do we have the materials? The soft constraints are the things that have to be done or could be, for example, a predecessor package. So you're going to have a package, you're installing a section of pipe in one IWP, and then the next IWP takes it on from there. You're not going to finish this one and wait three weeks before you start the next one. So when we say constraint-free, we're talking about the constraints that you can reasonably clear three weeks ahead. You don't equally, for example, build scaffolding a month before you need it, but you need to make sure that you know that it's going to be ready to meet that constraint timeline. Approval time. Depending on who you're getting to approve your IWPs, how long is it taking? Personally, I'm a fan of you get the construction general foreman or superintendent, so somebody from the construction hierarchy for that discipline, the safety person, the quality person. It might be that the safety person, for example, or the quality person is regularly sitting on them for too long. So you set a standard, you say, you know, we should be able to have all of these reviewed in, I think we've shown here in this example, six days. And then you monitor it to say, the status, that status thing that we were talking about before, it's sitting in ready for approval, uh, ready for review, but it's not yet approved. And on average, it's taking us 20 days to get them approved. Why is that? So then that gives you the ability to dig in better and say, where is the problem? Who is the problem? What's taking so long to review? And then you can work on fixing that. Ratio of planners to craft. How many people in the field is each planner supporting? So this is usually a wide ranging number depending on the level of complexity of the project, the level of experience of your planners, how good the tool is if you're using a tool um, for work packaging. For example, if you're having to build work packages manually without a tool like O3, you're gonna need more planners. So each planner isn't gonna be able to support as many people. But if you've got an experienced contractor with experienced planners using a good database tool and doing graphical work packaging, one planner, for example, could support up to 100 people on site just by building work packages and understanding how to build them efficiently and still doing good rigorous constraint management. Productivity factor, I mean, this is not unique to advanced work packaging, but certainly one of the things we're going to want to know as a result of this. One of the key parts of this is looking at the productivity factor at the level of the IWPs, for example. And the only way you can do that is to get your actual hours at the IWP level. Now, some people say this can't be done. It can be done. Uh, some people just aren't willing to try it. Um, if you can get that level of information, if you can get that level of data so that you know each IWP, what your PF is, what your productivity factor is, you can see the early trends. You can start forecasting sooner. You can get that improved predictability. If you're waiting until you're 50, 60, 70% complete at a discipline or, or even a project level before you start estimating, your, uh, before you start forecasting, you're going to go off the rails and you're not going to know about it. So having that productivity factor and having it at the same granular level, so you're looking at your earned hours from your progress on your IWPs and how many hours you expended to get there, you can have a good understanding of what your PF is and whether you're going to go off the rails. Also, we've said here target is above one. That's because I always look at it as earned over burned. I know some people look at it as burned over earned, so obviously flip that calculation. Lastly, time on tools. So time on tools is a reading of how much of their day your crews are actually spending fitting pipe, welding, etc. 
Um, so what we're looking at here is an indication of crew efficiency. And CII and COA studies um, years and years ago were showing between 33 and 37 percent. So in this case, 55 is actually pretty good. Um, O3 has a product um, called On Tools that can help you to track this and will give you a very good database driven approach to how this can be done. So this again is one of the outputs from AWP. This number should be higher on your AWP projects, especially if you're doing good constraint management than it would be on your non-AWP projects. And then looking at all of this in one place, so you can track all of these KPIs that we were just talking about within O3, and it allows you to see it all in a single dashboard. You can set up your dashboards in a repeatable way. So this, you basically say, here's the KPIs that we're gonna track. I mean, we've given you eight examples in the previous slides, but you can set up, here's the things that are important to me. And once you've set up those KPIs, you can keep using that same dashboard on this, all of your future projects. And most importantly, what this does, this dashboard gives you a high level of information, but critically, and what separates this from something like a Power BI, is you then click on the data and you can drill down into the source data that gave that number. So if we see that we've got one discipline that's always taking longer to get the work done in the field and the packages are sitting out there for longer, we can literally click on that column and drill down into that and find the, de the detailed data behind it so that we know where the problems are. So like I said, that's kind of a preview of some of the information we're gonna be sharing with you. Before we go any further, we're going to take a very quick look at what is already available in the industry. Um, so this is not O3 material. O3 um, participates uh, strongly in the Construction Indust Industry Institute. Um, so the good news is you're not starting from scratch. There is a lot of information already available about AWP. Much of it is being championed by CII. Um, from As a starting point, there is material available to you. It's a start to be a member of some data agencies like a BTI has created a landing page, which is where this little uh, job is. Um, so, resources tab, select AWP, and from there you can look at information and tools grouped by discover, engage, and expand. So, that talks to the various degrees and stages where you're at with your AWP maturity. So the Discover is kind of the 101 stuff. That's where you're getting into the basics, the primer, the acronyms and definitions, and some of those uh, research teams that established AWP as a best practice. Then you're getting into Engage, which is getting into more of the, okay, now we're doing it. How are we doing it? And that's gonna be things like the return on investment, the maturity level benefits, which looks at the different levels of AWP implementation. And then you get into a band where you're getting into the more granular discussions about AWP, things like the data requirements, supply chain visibility, and commissioning and startup. There's also other areas that you can go for for AWP information. COA, the Construction Owners Association of Alberta, was one of the first places that actually developed workplace planning and AWP. Um, there's also the AWP Institute, which is available at no cost and no membership required as a good source for work packaging information. And Concord Academy, there are other training options available, but O3 is a partner with the Concord Academy as part of our extensive network of partnerships. Okay, so back to the implementation toolkit. What are we doing? Why are we here today? What's the second half of this? I've been talking at you guys for 50 minutes. So now we want your opinion. We wanna know what gaps you see. We wanna know what tools and information you need. What have you been fighting with? What have you, what can you not find? We want to know what you don't understand, what you need direction in. If we can help to provide some of that back to you, that's exactly why we're doing this implementation toolkit. We know that we don't know everything. You're all at a different phase of your journey. You all have different experiences of AWP to date. So we want to understand the pain points because chances are, if you've got a pain point, so is somebody else. 
So this would have been too much to cover in one session. So we broke it into three parts. So when you've heard me refer to these three workshops, the first one we did back in October covered that building of foundation. The second one setting up for AWP success was FEL2 and FEL3. And today we're looking at detailed design. So in each of these workshops, we've been asking people, what's your opinion? What do you want to see? What are the gaps? So as a quick refresher, what we're proposing to include in detailed design is engineering key performance indicators, what an EWP should be, what a CWP should be, and what the constraints are on those two packages. And for construction, we're looking to include what should a contractor's workplace planning plan be? What should the work package and KPIs be? What should the dashboard look like, which is some of the things we were just looking at in a few minutes ago? How does graphical work packaging work, non-graphical work packaging, constraint level, constraint management at the IWP level, and then looking at progressing and reporting, test work packages, system turnover, and lessons learned. So that's the start point. That's the basis. Now we're going to get your input. So we've created a mural page. It's entirely web-based. You don't need to install anything. It's just an easy link. So uh, there's a link here on the screen. This same link has been included in the chat. So when you go to Mural, when you click on this, it's going to bring up Mural in your web browser. Remember to leave your GoToMeeting in so that you can hear the instructions. Um, OK, so we're going to click on the Mural session. And I'll run you through what we're going to do with this mural. So, oh, here we go. Uh, okay, so, zoom out a little bit. So I see some people already in, which is great. Uh, oops. Okay, so for the mural, we've broken it up into several sections. So in the top section here, what we've asked for is for everybody to indicate who they are and what the, uh, what type of organization they work for. Um, so for this, you're going to tell us if you represent an owner organization, if you represent an EPC or engineering contractor, if you're a construction contractor, or if you are a partner, vendor, consultant, or other. So what we're going to do first up is if everybody can take a minute create a sticky note you can just copy and paste somebody else's sticky note that's often the easiest way to get this going and we'll delete some of these strange shapes that seem to have appeared um, so copy and paste somebody else's sticky note put your name your position title and the company you work for into the relevant bracket into the relevant group here within this uh, within this top section whether you're an owner epc construction contractor or vendor and this would also be a good opportunity, especially as we are halfway through, if anyone needs a minute to take a bio break while people are putting their names up here, this would be a great time to do it. And uh, Andrew, I think this also would be a great time to field a few questions that came in during the presentation. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, and a reminder, if you have questions, just submit them over in the uh, question panel on your screen through GoToWebinar. So first question we've got here, it says, if the scope is not locked and massive changes, does AWP success continue on schedule due to the immaturity of the owner changing scope? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Uh, no, I mean, I, I would always advocate that AWP will help with that. But ultimately, if the owner isn't following a proper process of locking their scope during the FEL stages, um, then you're always going to have issues downstream. Uh, this, that's, this is the whole point of what of what FEL3 is supposed to be. I mean, you're supposed to choose your concept, select in FEL2, and refine your scope and lock your scope in FEL3. You shouldn't be making significant changes. And that's where, you know, as I was talking about the path of construction, locking it down. So I think what I would say with something like that is AWP would help to shine a light on some of those issues so that if you are dealing with an owner who keeps changing things on you, you've got the ability to say, you know, this is going to cause a new engineering work package 
we're going to have to keep changing the work packages that we've got, etc. It'll give you more of a basis than just, you know, please stop making changes. All right, uh, here's another one. EWPs typically reference the deliverables, e.g. drawings. How do you handle document revisions and their corresponding impact on the EWPs? So what, I mean, the, the standard book answer to that is the EWP should not be released until it's IFC and ready to go. And ideally, and I say ideally because I have worked on construction projects and I know this doesn't happen. Ideally, you don't want any change after IFC. If, however, which always happens, you do end up getting change after IFC. Essentially, this is where something like an O3 tool would come in very, very useful because by tying the workface planning tool into the um, document management system, you can get those revisions and updates and you can look at it against the work packages that you've already created to say, what does this drawing impact? How many IWPs, how many downstream packages are impacted by this change? Where are those packages? So all of this is spelled out in the procedure that we just created and there's a, there's a workflow diagram that goes with it to say, how do I deal with change management? So if you revise a drawing, and I'm the planner for the construction company and I get this new drawing, what do I do with it? And essentially it's a question of figure out which IWPs are impacted, figure out their status. And if they haven't yet been completed, you incorporate them into the packages. If they have been completed, it becomes a rework. But yes, great question because unfortunately it does happen. All right. Um, Next one, it says, what does PDC stand for? But they may have meant POC. No, sorry, PDC, I was referring to, it's the, the electrical power distribution building. Um, so it's the main electrical building that provides power to the site. So when we're talking about all those large cables, um, a lot of them will originate at that power building um, and then run power from there in a big sort of spider web out to the various elements of the site. So. So that's where a lot of your big cables start. All and right. if you did mean POC, POC is an acronym for Path of Construction. Great, great answers. Um, let's see if there's any more here. Um, okay, uh, can you start AWP at construction? Uh, yes and no. You can start at construction, but then it's not AWP. Um, so the difference between AWP and workface planning, workface planning is the bit that happens in the field. So the workface planning is the construction element. Advanced work packaging is by definition, the advanced part is intended to imply that you're doing it during the engineering stages. So advanced, you can, if you are, and we've had a lot of people we've dealt with over the years who, you know, yes, we're doing AWP and we're starting construction next week. Um, work packaging can help with that and and software like o3 can definitely help with that but if you are properly doing advanced work packaging you're starting in the earlier phases okay um here's another one what's the difference between graphical packages and non-graphical so graphical is where you're pulling the information directly from the model. So your engineering contractor will build, typically for a lot of projects, especially uh, larger projects, they'll build a 3D model. And there's a lot of information, a lot of data that goes with that 3D model. And if it's set up properly, you can take that information and you can pull it into uh, what we call this virtual construction model which we can use then, and that's what, this is part of what O3 does with our on-build software, where we'll take that 3D model, pull the data across, augment it with, for example, fabrication information. So instead of just a series of components, we know what's already been built into a, um, into a spool, for example. And then you can just pull spools into an IWP, into a work package. And by doing that, the system will automatically understand, based on all the data that's in the model behind it, what drawing number that relates to, how many hours you get for that IWP, what the materials are for that IWP, so you can create a pick list for it. So the graphical work packaging is a very, very powerful tool 
for work packaging in the field. Non-graphical work packaging um, will typically mean, from, certainly from our perspective, what that means is still using a tool like O3, but using it on a for those lists that I was talking about earlier, where it's like a cable schedule. So you'll take the cable schedule, you'll pull the cables, you know, you'll grab in individual entries from that cable schedule right in the work packaging tool, and you'll pull those in and create those as components in a work package. Some people, when they're talking about non-graphical work packaging, they're talking about the old school mentality where you're literally building work packages with you know, a piece of paper and a pen um, and doing it with Excel spreadsheets and Word documents, which can work. It's just much, much more labor intensive. So that the trick with something like a piece of software is it takes more effort on the front end to get it set up. But once you do, it's much, much quicker to execute. Um, whereas if you just turn up with a stack of isometrics and start writing scope of work documents, it'll seem like you can get going quicker, but it's going to take you a lot more time to actually execute. Okay, um, I think we've got a good few names in here. I'm just going to try and zoom out a little bit. My zooming is um, proving tricky today. Um, so... see if I can get this. There we go. Um, so what we're looking at here now is the second section of what we want to look at now is, okay, I'm just going to, sorry, bear with me. There we go. So Andrew, you might need to make that a teensy bit smaller for us if you don't mind. Um, so what we're looking at now is the next session of the, the next part of this mural is what we're referring to as the push section. So this is us saying to you, here's what we're going to include. So the section you see below here is, Andrew, there you go. Um, so this is the stuff that we were just covering. Here's what we're going to provide to you. So this is where for the detailed design, we're looking at engineering key performance indicators. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. Uh, so what we're planning to give you for detailed design is KPIs for engineering, engineering work packages, construction work packages, and EWP, CWP constraints. And then for construction and completions, again, we've broken it down into those three different sections. So we're looking at the workface planning plan, the KPIs, the workface planning dashboards, graphical work packaging, non-graphical work packaging, and constraint management and then the progress and reporting, test work packages, system turnover, and lessons learned. So that's the plan. Now in the sections below here, where you'll see what we're referring to here as a pull section, part two, we've got those same boxes, detailed design and construction and completions, and this is what we want you guys to fill in. So what we want to know is, in the context of what I've told you we're going to provide, what else do you need? What have we not said? What have we not allowed for? So we're going to give you about 10 minutes, uh, we'll see how the see how it goes, but we'll look to give you at least five or 10 minutes to get some ideas in here, give us some ideas of what you want, and then we'll have a voting session. So in order to do this, the easiest way to create these is simply to click on one that already exists, copy paste it, and as somebody's already started to do here with this next green one. So create your own, copy paste the one that's already in there. That'll give you the easiest way of making sure the size is right and the letters are the correct size. And tell us what else you need to know. So while people are doing that, uh, well, probably I'll keep quiet for a minute or two so people can actually think. And then Tori, we can see if there's any other questions that are coming in. If anyone has any other questions while we're doing this, or if anyone's unclear on what we're doing, feel free to raise a question in the go to meeting and Tori can read it out. Sure thing. Just <clears throat> let me know when you're ready for another question. Now we can see. Okay. Okay, sorry, while people are starting to type in here, 
Do we have any other questions coming up? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, why are you breaking the construction up into three phases? Yeah. So there is this typical sort of historic mindset that construction is the boots on the ground. It's the, you know, we're ready to go. Um, part of what AWP does and workplace planning for the field portion is change that mindset. You don't start work packages two minutes before you're going to have, you know, people boots on the ground. So you need the reason we're, we're setting all this up is the first phase where this really kicks in is even during the bid. So if I'm representing the owner, for example, I want during the bid stage, I need to tell the construction contractors that we're going to do AWP, that we're going to do work phase planning. I want to be able to assess their level of skill and experience at how to do work phase planning. Um, I want to, I've got to give them a heads up that this is actually going to happen. Um, and then, so I can have that as part of my assessment when I'm picking a construction contractor. Um, and then even before the people start arriving on site, we need to be building packages for us to get that backlog that we talked about, that sort of 30 days of constraint free work. I need the engineering, I need the, the material, and then I need to start building packages. So if we are trying to do that as soon as we've mobilized people, we're already too late. So the reason we're breaking it up is to imply that there is a step-by-step -step process. You don't just sit down day one and start building work packages. There's various steps and you don't mobilize a full crew before you've got that um, before you've got that backlog in place. Okay, and then is creating an EWP like this extra work for engineers? Shouldn't be. Um, a lot of people will say yes to that question, but in reality, the engineers have to provide the drawings, they have to provide the specs, they have to provide what they were going to provide anyway. I think where a lot of people see the issues from the engineering side is the granularity and the phasing of it, the time phasing of it. So instead of just chucking over the fence whatever engineering has finished, we're actually asking them to do it in a systematic way that suits the needs of construction. Um, so there is definitely some pushback within engineering about this. And some of the engineers, a lot of the engineering contractors currently are doing AWP because they have to, um, but we are starting to see some engineering contractors, and this came up during a presentation we put on at the AWP conference about, we're starting to see some engineering contractors are starting to find value in this AWP centric approach. Um, where they can do their own sort of level four planning and they can start using design work packages, which for them are akin to the construction, uh, the installation work package in the field. So this, I think from a engineering contractors on the lower maturity end of AWP, they may see a little bit of extra, but a lot of them, once we sort of get more mature in how to use AWP, it just becomes packaging the work that they were already going to do slightly differently. Um, okay, so what have we got? Is there any other questions or are we going to start looking at some of the... You can get back into mural now. Okay, so it looks like so far we've only got a few suggestions for what we need, uh, constraint analysis worksheets, system turnover requirements, and something for risk analysis. Okay, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, that's a good one. And then as a reminder, we currently are including KPIs for engineering and construction, EWP and CWP info and constraint management. What else should we add? Right, so that's the kind of central question. So. I guess to sort of replay the, the question here and, and what we're seeing on the construction and completion side. So some of this, that's obviously where the system turnover would come in. And again, with that constraint analysis worksheet. So I think what we're seeing here, unless anyone's got some additional, uh, some additional 
point. Um, yeah, thank you for pulling that out. Um, I think what we're seeing here is that it looks like we're covering most of the bases that people are looking to see. Um, and this is a very interesting process because I know for the first for the first session we did, we had a lot of new ideas of things we needed to cover. And for the second session, less so. And I think people, once you get into the construction side of things, quite honestly, if you're covering how to do IWPs and TWPs, that's going to be the vast majority of the process. Um, so if anyone else has any other ideas, uh, please feel free to keep adding them. And then we'll see if there's enough body here to uh, to vote on. Differences between requirements for different sizes of projects. Yeah, um, so AWP is not a, there's been a lot of work in the last several years about scalability with AWP, because it started off being just for mega projects and people would only look at it for you know, anything that included the word billion in the dollar section. Um, there's been a lot of work recently about making it more applicable and appropriate for smaller projects. Um, and I think there's a lot of the basic principles of rigorous planning, setting your path of construction. I mean, I've done path of construction sessions for tiny projects. So you don't need to do a full blown AWP process for a tiny project, but you can certainly use some of the elements. So on that, we've actually just, the, the subcommittee that I'm chairing for CII has just produced what we refer to as a, a selection criteria tool for CII where you can put in a lot of information. You answer a series of questions about your project and it will tell you whether AWP is appropriate for your project and if so, what sort of level of AWP that you can do because it's not all the same. Some projects you might just do the work face planning. Some projects you might just do the front end and not do work face planning. So there are different ways that you can tackle this. Um, so different size projects. It, I think the, the simple answer is, and yes, I'm, I appreciate the the, uh, the ideas here, that the big answer there is it needs to be fit for purpose. You're not going to have a team of workface planners and AWP professionals on a project that's $100,000. Um, sometimes it's just not value added. So the biggest issue there is going to be run that return on investment calculation. Make sure it's going to be beneficial to your project. And if you've got multiple projects, target the ones where it's going to be most beneficial first. Best mixture of workface planning team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the identification of the personnel is a big one. Who should the planners be? Typically, the historical part was that the planners were considered sort of general foreman level. It's a hard thing to do to get general foreman to sit at a computer and type on a on a or build work packages. Um, I've seen it done with sort of young project engineer types or but what you're really targeting for people building your work packages is people who know how to execute it in the field. So you are looking at that foreman level at minimum and somebody who's going to be able to produce something that the field people can actually follow and agree with. What you don't want is for your planner to produce an IWP, hand it to the, the people in the field, and the people in the field say, well, this is nonsense, we're not gonna do it that way. Um, so yes, that's, that's a good start. Is Mural part of AWP and how would it be utilized? My immediate reaction to that was gonna be no, but um, funnily enough, we are using Mural um, more and more these days because of everybody, because of COVID and all the issues we've had with digital sort of collaboration, um, we're actually setting up, for example, some path of construction sessions using Mural because a path of construction is typically a bunch of people in a room and you can do it with sticky notes on a wall. Well, Mural is just a digital version of sticky notes on a wall. So you can use something like Mural to um, create a digital version of a path of construction. That being said, I am always, always, always an advocate of doing these things in person, if you can, um, but it's just a question of what uh, availability right now that you have in terms of personnel. 
Uh, what else have we got? What digital tools would you recommend? Well, I think the answer to that is going to be I work for a company that produces AWP software, so obviously my answer there is going to be O3. Um, as I said at the beginning, O3 is is the only software on the market that's literally been designed ground up for advanced work packaging. We're not we're not one of those tools that sort of latched onto it partway through and said, oh, we'll we'll change what we've already got to make this. And it's not just a cobbled together thing of different acquisitions and labels that have all been sort of put under the same logo. It is literally AWP software. That being said, the AWP software sits in the middle of everything else. So the AWP software is not an island. The AWP software, like AWP itself, is an integration tool. You will still need Primavera or AN other for doing your schedules. You'll still need a document management system, a materials management system, a three-dimensional three model. There are other tools that you will need to tie into. We are not a document management system. If somebody tells you, and this is just me speaking from experience before I was with O3, if somebody comes to you and says, our solution does everything. It'll do your estimate, your schedule, your materials management, your document management, your AWP, the whole thing. Mm, I would be very, 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 very cautious of that. The best approach that I've used when I was working for owner organizations is treat the software as best in class. So use the best in class software that you can find for, for estimating, for scheduling, for for work packaging, for AWP, for a document management system, materials management system. These tools these days are sophisticated enough that they can speak to each other. They can talk to each other. They can share information. They can communicate. Integrate the best in class software solutions and that'll give you the best approach. If you try to cobble it all together into one tool or even worse, try and do it using an Excel spreadsheet, you're going to have a heck of a time with it. Um, are you working with the joint group with Lean Construction? I, I'm not part of that team, but I've had several discussions. I actually sat through the presentation that they did. Um, I think the interesting part is, the, I think the biggest thing that came out of that uh, joint group between Lean and, and AWP is that these are two things oftentimes saying the same thing, but using slightly different language. AWP is more process centric whereas lean appears to be far more about the person person side of it it's a lot more about that sort of making promises and and trusting your fellow uh, you know trusting your colleagues and stakeholders and coordination whereas awp is much more the step-by-step -step how to guide and i think the most interesting thing that came out of that conference is the lean people saw a lot of good things in awp and AWP saw a lot of good things in Lean. So these are not, there's, there's been this sort of Montague and Capulet thing where they're mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. They're all just trying to deliver as best and efficiently as possible. Um, they're coming at it from different perspectives. Obviously, AWP was more industrial construction. Lean was more looking at it from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, but there's definitely benefits to both. And I don't think it's in any way if you do one, you can't do some of the other. Okay, well, that's excellent. Thank you all for producing those. Uh, I think we've covered all of the system turnover requirements, constraints analysis, something for risk analysis. So I'm definitely gonna give that risk analysis one a bit of thought. Um, so I think we've covered those. I don't think we need a voting session because we've got several there, um, but the numbers are small enough that we don't need to pick out the top ones. I can just, uh, certainly pick off the information from all of those and take the parts and incorporate those into what we're producing. So thank you all very much for that. We're going to switch back now to our presentation. We've got a couple more slides and then I think what we're going to be able to do is get everybody out of here a little bit early and give you half an hour of your day back. So what is this and where is this? So we talked about there are, uh, we have done the first couple of batches of release of deliverables. So we've got, and all of these are essentially, they're all zip files. You download them. And in each case, there's a document that explains what it is. And then where there is an attachment, you'll also get the attachment. So for example, learning about AWP is just an attempt on our part to guide you through the massive amount of information that already exists. 
business case and ROI is actually a PowerPoint presentation. And the intent with that one, for example, is me saying, if I was selling this AWP to your management team, here's how I would try to explain it to them. Here's how I would build the business case for it. Here's what I would present to them. So again, that's in the PowerPoint in PowerPoint mode in um, in native format. So you can take that, use as much of that information as you like. Um, just change the logo, pull the O3 logo out, and put your own logo into it. Choosing a pilot project, um, as I mentioned, is a document that speaks about the kind of things you need to consider when looking for a pilot project. Uh, then the next two deliverables we got into are the AWP procedure. So I would recommend that for those of you trying to develop an AWP process in-house, that's going to be a good place to start. Um, configure it to your heart's content, make it right for you, but uh, it'll give you a good starting point that means you don't need to spend months and months going out and trying to find an outsource way of doing that. Um, and the last one is currently available is the AWP workflows which are diagrams produced in Visio format and in PDF, for those of you who haven't got Visio, that show some of the key workflows of AWP and the swim lanes of who does what. So all of those are currently available at the link that you see below. Um, Tori, can we post that link into the chat just in case people aren't being able to copy paste it or cut it in? Yes, we actually have posted it if you check out the chat over on your panel there's the, yeah there's gonna be the link to the um implementation kit and the ci resources every, pretty much every link we've discussed today is going to be in that chat but then we're also going to send it to you in all of the follow-up information so don't don't worry if you haven't seen it um yet excellent thank you very much Terry. so you can also review recordings of previous of these workshops so there's also a whole lot of other resources and information within the O3 website. So feel free to have a look at that and reach out to us if you have any other questions. And on that note, I'm going to finally stop talking and I'll, uh, I'll let Tori close us out. Yeah, so as we mentioned, um, we are going to give you all of the links that we have posted in the chat. Those will be in your follow-up uh, materials with the presentation, the recording, and you'll have the link to access all of the published materials we've discussed. So in addition to that, you can also learn more about O3 at our website at www.o3.solutions. Um, it includes all kinds of NAOP resources. We've got case studies, blog posts. We, we post those very frequently. Um, and we've got webinars that we've had in the past, so our backlog of all of that is there along with plenty of videos and explainers going into a variety of topics on AWP um, and then some of our solutions that support AWP. And then lastly, you can just sign up for our monthly newsletter and that way you can always stay up to date on what we're doing next um, and what events we'll be participating in. And with that in mind, we actually have an event coming up um, we're going to be part of the Integrated Project Delivery Conference in May, and that's hosted by Group ASI, and that includes AWP plus Lean plus other methods like Agile. So, um, that now, if you have other questions that we did not get to, please reach out to us. We're happy to answer them if we covered some things that you want more detail on or need um, need other information just please email us at info at o3.solutions or you can visit our website as i already mentioned um, and again reminder we're going to be sending you out all of this information in the coming days so you'll be able to access everything um, so with that thanks for joining us if you uh, have anything else please reach out and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day thanks again andrew for your very informative and engaging presentation thanks everyone for listening in take care